For me, the early desire to write stemmed from reading, a habit that my father encouraged in me and my siblings. Most Fridays, I, I remember, uh, he used to bring the four of us children to Alamar's bookstore in Cebu, where we had free reign to buy any magazine or book we wanted. I started out reading comics, and then I read books like the Nancy Drew and Hardy Boys series, and then I got a little bit more sophisticated and I read Anne of Green Gables and later on uh, uh, Hemingway and Faulkner. Um, and still much, much later on, when I had a realization of the kind of Eurocentric training that I got in school, I went out of my way to read writings by Filipino authors and other international writers. The desire to write started when I was young. My father died when I was nine and um, just without any prodding, I started to write him letters to more or less update him of my life. At some point when I was a teenager, my sister gave me a pink lock and key diary um, in which I wrote poems and random thoughts and feelings. Um, they were not really very good, but this practice made me fall in love with words on paper. And in fact, I probably really enjoyed expressing my feelings. The book, Anne Frank, was a model. And just like Anne Frank had named her diary Kitty, I named mine Sharon. In school, I loved theme writing and I wrote a few pieces that were published in school journals. But along with the love of words on paper, I fell in love with story. From the time I was a child, I used to listen to dramas on radio soap operas. My siblings and I also went to movies practically every weekend. So the idea of store of characters in conflict, working out their problems, and either solving these problems or not, were embedded in my head. Further, growing up in Cebu, which was a small place when I was young in the 1950s, I was fascinated with the stories of the people and also about local folklore. Practically every Marianda time, people would come by, visit my mother, or my mother would visit them, and they would talk. I mean, I guess it was gossip, but they would talk about what happened to so-and-so, and, -so, and uh, they would run through the gamut of, of the goings-on in, in small Cebu, and I became familiar with the threads of people's lives via these gossip sessions of my mother and her friends. And at night, the servants like to talk about, tell stories about witches and stories about Sigmin and Encantados, all of which fascinated me. In fact, our jackfruit tree in our backyard was supposed to have had an anta. This is an enchanted black giant and there were spirits and duendes all around, so that even as a little girl, I never threw anything in the dark because I was afraid I'd hit one of those spirits or duendes and be punished by them. So loving stories and writing finally led me to attempt writing fiction, which is one of the things I do. I was actually already 30 some years old and was already married and living in California with my husband and sons. The children were in school and I had some spare time. And aside from writing a newspaper column, I tried to write stories that had been floating around in my head. Some of the early stories were published in Philippine magazines like The Graphic, Focus Philippines, Mr. and Ms. Um, even though they were published, I felt I could do better. And when I had the opportunity, I started taking creative writing classes at the writer's program at UCLA Extension. These classes helped me. Um, it, I picked up skills. I also learned the business of writing, uh, specifically information about manuscript preparation, submissions, uh, the whole story about literary agents and publishers, copyright matters, and so on. And I started submitting my work and bit by bit, my short stories are published in literary journals and anthologies here in the US. And at some point I found I had enough for a collection. 
It was at this time when I met the noted writer Bienvenido and Santos, Ben, to his friends, who suggested to me that I submit my book proposal to his publisher, Mrs. Gloria Rodriguez at New Day. Mrs. Rodriguez published my first short story collection, Woman with Horns. And let me show you what it looks like. So this was my very first book, very slender, but it was the first. And um, after that, Mrs. Rodriguez also published a uh, collection of essays, uh, which I titled Philippine Woman in America. Um, she was also very kind in publishing uh, a book that I edited, Fiction by Filipinos in America. And most importantly, Mrs. Rodriguez published my first novel that appeared under the title of Song of Yvonne. This was a coming of age novel of a young girl named Yvonne during World War II. And as fate would have it, the same novel under the title of When the Rainbow Goddess Wept was later picked up by Dutton Penguin. Let me show you a, a copy of that one. Um, so this is the uh, Dutton Penguin uh, version. Um, and later on by the University of Michigan Press. And uh, still much later on to make it available back in the Philippines because the very, very first edition was out of print, um, the University of Santo Tomas Publishing House picked it up. This particular first novel was also translated into Turkish. Um, and I am happy to say that 30 years from when it was first published, the novel remains in print in the United States and in the Philippines. This first novel and most, most of my early short stories were set in my mythical place called Ubek, U-B-E-C, which is Cebu spelled backwards. Ubek, in my mind, is a place that is like Cebu, but it's not really Cebu. I took the place I was born and grew up in, and I rearranged it, so to speak, in my imagination. I picked and chose what fit my mythical world. The characters in Ubek may have been inspired by real life people of Cebu, but they are now fictional in Ubek. Fictionalizing Cebu and the people I knew gave me the opportunity to create fleshed out characters in historically grounded situations, but at the same time left me free to tweak their conflicts and their responses and their development. It left me free to tell their stories. As far as what I do, aside from writing three novels, I have also published three short story collections, a uh, woman with horns and other stories, Acapulco at sunset and other stories, and vegan and other stories. Most of the stories from these books are collected in my recent uh, selected short stories published by the University of Santo Tomas Publishing House. And let me just grab the book to show you. So this is this is that uh, selected short stories. While I have written many stories set in Ubeck. I have also written stories set in Manila and other parts of the Philippines. I have also explored what I call my Filipino American experience in my writings. In fact, I have stories set in various parts of the world, Spain, Mexico, Turkey, France. What is important to me when writing stories is a character. And as long as I'm interested in the character, I can write about them regardless of where they come from. The other literary thing I do is editing anthologies. I have edited 10 in total. This work started out early in my writing career when I could not find a collection of Filipino American short stories. With the encouragement of my publisher then, Gloria Rodriguez, I edited Fiction by Filipinos in America, uh, and I followed this up with contemporary fiction by Filipinos in America. And I have edited other books, including religious books, Magnificat, Mama Mary's Pilgrim Sites, 
and finding God through stories of spiritual encounters. There is still another literary work I do uh, that not very many people know, and that is I run PALH, or Philippine American Literary House. This is a small publishing house, a small press, that has published anthologies and the writings of Linda T. Casper and Veronica Montes. Um, for instance, its recent publication is a book by Linda T. Casper, which she calls The Memoir of Her Husband, the late Leonard Ralph Casper. And the title is, Will You Happen Past the Silence Through the Darkness, Remembering Leonard Ralph Casper. So to conclude, while I have written many stories, including three novels set in Ubeck, my writing and my work has explored other subject matters and my literary activities have gone beyond writing to include editing and publishing. My roots in Cebu run deep. I have seen official documents mentioning my great-great-grandmother, Juana Lopez, dated in the 1800s. Juana had a daughter, Remedios, who married Mariano Albao Cuenco, a public school teacher who became poet, writer, publisher, clerk of court, and a contender for governorship, although he lost. It was his son, Mariano Jesus Cuenco, my mother's father, who vindicated him because Mariano Jesus became governor, senator, secretary of public works and communications, secretary of agriculture, commerce, and labor, and at the height of his political career was Senate president. My mother's family, the Cuencos, lived in the heart of old Cebu, the Parian where many other so-called old families lived. It was and remains a place rich in history and which fascinates me to this day. When I visit Cebu, I always make it a point to visit the Parian. I visit the Santo Nino, the Catedral, the, uh, the Plaza Independencia, the fort, the whole area is rich in history. Mariano Jesus, my grandfather, married a woman from Carcar, Filomena Alesna. And so I am familiar with Carcar and its American period buildings and Art Deco bandstand, the local delicacies like Chicharron, Ampau, and Lechon. My, we, we used to drive over there and, and my mother would talk about St. Catherine's and, and uh, we would visit the church. So these are all close to my heart and they all, these details made their way into my stories. I was born after the war when my parents and their three children had returned to the city in Cebu City to rebuild their post-war life. It is Cebu I know. The very first breath I took was in Cebu. My first words were those spoken by Cebuanos. Even though I'd gone on to live in other places in the world, it is as if I carry a part of Cebu within me always. And likewise, I feel as if Cebu has a place for me always. I grew up with three siblings. I was a large baby when I was born, almost 10 pounds, but sickly, I had beriberi, a disease caused by thiamine deficiency and characterized by edema, weakness, irritability, and more serious issues such as heart problems. I could have died, in other words. My mother suffered from lingering effects of World War II when she carried me in her womb. She was malnourished, which meant that I, the baby in her stomach, was malnourished. The lack of vitamin B caused the beriberi and I almost died. My mother turned to the Santo Nino de Cebu, the child Jesus patron of Cebu, famous for being miraculous. She danced her prayer just like the women you can still see shuffling their prayer dances in front of the old stone church that houses the beloved child Jesus. For the rest of her life, my mother always reminded me of my debt to the Santo Nino. You owe your life to him, she used to tell me. 
as she dragged me to hear mass in the Santo Nino church. And there I watched women dance their prayers and walk on their knees down the center aisle. And I smelled incense and burning candles. And I looked in awe at the small sized Santo Nino clothed in red robes while waiting for the interminable mass to end. I continued to make it a point to visit the Santo Nino when I am in Cebu. So back in 1947 from the clinic, I was brought to the house my family lived in. First in Talisay, it was a tem temporary dwelling, a place my parents and their three children stayed in after the war ended. The house was made of wood on stilts like a big nipa hut. It was situated near the sea. And so early on, I slept and I woke to the sound of waves lapping, on the, sh lapping the shore and to fishermen shouting as they beached their outriggers. I was used to taking in the sea breeze and to having salt on my skin and in my hair. My parents eventually acquired land in Cebu City where they finally built our home across some cornfields near a river and the foothills, an area that was sparsely populated and remote at that time. My father drew the plans and hired workers to construct a house. It was a Spanish style house with balconies, marble floors and crystal chandeliers. So there was the main house with the kitchen, living room, dining room, bedrooms, bathrooms, veranda, and balconies. There was another structure for the servants and the cooking hearth. This was outside. We called it a dirty kitchen. There was a water tank. And way in the back of the property was a garage and storage building, a place that I rarely visited because rats and monitor lizards lived there. And more importantly, the nearby jackfruit tree had an agta, the enchanted black giant, living in it. Needless to say, there were endless stories about the agta, how the servants and even my brother had seen him one night when the moon was full. There were some other creepy happenings in our house too. A house beca uh, maid became possessed and had to be exorcised by the redemptorist priest. This is a true story. On Lent, strange happenings would occur, and these were all credited to the encantados that lurked around the area. Indeed, living in that house stimulated my imagination because there were endless supernatural stories as well as down-to-earth stories like love affairs and out-of-wedlock pregnancies. The radio soap operas in the early evening were also good primers and make-believe because most evenings the servants listened to the convoluted plots dealing with love, revenge, and other deep human passions all interlaced with conflict. I used to sit and listen with them in the outside kitchen with the open hearth where I watched live chickens being decapitated for that night's supper. My berry berry had frightened my mother, and when I was a girl, she made sure I got my Vidalin vitamins daily, and I had to drink milk every morning with, evap with breakfast. She would put half a cup of evaporated milk with water and some sugar, like baby formula. In the evening, she made me take one raw egg, the whole slimy thing. She was constantly prodding me to eat, giving me choice morsels from the dining table, chicken gizzard and liver, for instance. I recall a summer episode when I had to eat some dreaded vegetables and finally to silence my mother who kept prodding me, I pretended to chew the veggies only to secretly spit them into my hands and give them to one of our police dogs. After a few years, the trees my mother had planted grew tall, and I loved to climb the tall star apple trees with slender branches. There, I indulge in fantasies about enchanted forests and magical giant pearls found in the heart of a banana fruit, the mutia. Sometimes I would get utterly lost in my dream world and would miss the call for lunch, Grumbling, my sister would have to make threats to get me down from those beloved trees. When I was four, my mother enrolled me at St. Teresa's College in Cebu. This sort of ended the unhindered daydreaming I had in that house. My life became more regimented, up at six, shower, put on your 
blue and white uniform, eat breakfast, go to school by 7.15, first class met at eight o'clock and so on. I learned about rules and homework and sitting still with my hands folded together. The nuns were very strict. They were disciplinarians. They were good educators, but disciplinarians, the Belgian nuns. This was the time I started to get scolded for daydreaming. That is, I was not paying attention, but the nuns did allow daydreaming when it came to theatrical plays and theme writing, which I love. But so it, it was a time, this period of my life was when I learned discipline, even though I was daydreaming. So all the family background and Cebu places and history and culture became part of my writer's palette palette, so to speak, right? Artists have their palette and writers have their palette. And elements, these elements made their way into my stories. There, my father is in the character of Fernando Macaraig in my first novel, When the Rainbow Goddess Wept, an American schooled civil engineer who had to bring his family to Mindanao when World War II broke out. There, is my mother in Angeling Makaraig, the beautiful, edgy woman who had a stillborn son in Mindanao during World War II. There, the Santo Nino Church and Spanish Fort are. There, the sea and hills with coconuts and sugar cane. My stories about Cebu grow Ubek. My stories about Ubek grew out of Cebu and have Cebu all over the place. I am sure that everything I read must have influenced in some degree my writing. The comics that I read when I was a little girl taught me about storytelling, about drama, about characters and stress, about using scenes while telling a story. The books I read from the time I picked up my first Nancy Drew to the more sophisticated Hemingway Faulkner novels reinforced my love for words on print, for elegant writing, for the notion of something happening to the character in stories. These books strengthened my desire to write my own stories, hopefully about memorable characters and situations. When I took my fiction writing with more seriousness and took writing workshops, I had another what you call fork in the road. In an early writing workshop, a participant critiqued my work and said my writer's voice was off. My writer's voice was off. So this led me into a journey of figuring out what exactly is writer's voice. One of the first things I did was to read works by famous authors. The classics, uh, books by Fyodor, Dost Fyodor Dostoevsky, Gabriel Garcia Marquez, Gustave Flaubert. And I read the works of our Cebuana writer, Lina Espina Moore, who mentored me. I wanted to find out what made their work unique. The questions in my, in my mind included, why do I know? This work is by Gabriel Garcia Marquez and not Gustave Flaubert's. And why could I discern that Lina, Espina, Lina Espina's work was about Cebu when it was written in English? I noted that some of the novels I studied were translations, Russian, Spanish, French. Uh, Lina's books that I picked up were in English. So there I was reading books in English, and yet I could figure out which was by a Russian, which was by a French, which was by a Cebuana, and so on. So it seemed to me that writer's voice did not rely too much on language, but more on other elements like subject matter, the characters created, um, and these characters brought with them their own culture, their own personal histories, as well as the overall history of their world or their setting. The values and spirits of the writers manifested themselves in their written works. 
So without anyone telling me who the writer was, I could tell if I was reading Dostoevsky or Graham Greene. While studying these books, these works, I also experimented with my own fiction writing. There was one thing, I did not want to sound Americanized, and so I deliberately chose Cebu as my subject matter. Cebu and its characters are very close to my heart after all. I quickly learned though that if I wanted to be more free with my characters, then I should use my mythical place of Ubek instead of Cebu, and I should not lock myself to the real characters I had known. The birth of Cebu came about and I was doodling on a piece of paper. I don't know what prompted me to do so, but I reversed the letters of Cebu and doodled U-B-E-C, and this word Ubek shone in that piece of paper. And since then, I generally use it in place of Cebu. Some of these, my experimental writings, you know, when I was sort of trying to figure out write, writer's voice or published, and this encouraged me. And after more writing, I got the hang of focusing on character and character development. I learned that my characters could come from any place in the world, any, as long as they were fleshed out, complex characters with believable conflicts. In fact, I learned I could even write about the dog as the main protagonist. That is, I could enter the dog's head, uh, check out my story called Romeo. Um, so we are in that dog's point of view. I had a writing teacher, the esteemed Leonardo Bercovici, who used to tell us, tell his students to enter the heads of your character, meaning one had to see, feel, and think like the character. Another very important fork in my writing development was discovering ancient Philippine epics. In California, I befriended some academics and writers who had a study group on Philippine folklore at UCLA. We used to meet at the university where we read transliterations of ancient Philippine epics about Lamang, Agu, and others. From these epics, I learned not just ancient stories that were still being sung, at least in the 1980s in remote places in the Philippines, but there were inferred facts about ancient Filipinos. So what do I mean by this? For instance, uh, there was a Philippine epic that had a goddess, Meibuyan, and the goddess made Buyan had multiple breasts on her body because she had to nurse dead babies before they crossed the river of the dead. So what this really meant was that there were many infancy deaths among ancient Filipinos, which was why their mythology included the goddess made Buyan who could take care of their dead babies. These transliterations, the epic transliterations, were not easy to read, in fact, and I made it my own personal project to retell them in simple language like children's stories. I thought my epic retellings were charming, but I didn't send them out for publication, but just kept them in my filing cabinet. Then it happened one day later on when I challenged myself to write a novel, which underwent an evolution before settling into becoming, into being a coming of age story of a young girl during World War II. I was reading my draft one day when I remembered my epic retellings and just on a whim, just for fun, I popped one of those epic retellings in my novel draft. And I liked the juxtaposition of my characters' struggles during World War II and the ancient story with gods and goddesses and battles and heroes and heroines. So I continued popping in the other epic retellings in this first novel. It was not until I finished the work and my novel was critiqued when I realized that my World War II story was actually the epic song of the young girl, Yvonne. So this was why the original title in the first Philippine edition was Song of Yvonne. Yvonne was telling this fantastic epic story of their struggles and survival during the time when evil and destruction surrounded them. And they had to be heroic like the epic heroes of old. 
There are many other reading materials and influences to my writing, but the ones I mentioned nudged me to look at critical moments of Philippine history where people were under a lot of stress, such as the Philippine-American War or World War II, for example. These moments added increased conflict to my characters, which forced my characters to make choices and to move. This is the essence of storytelling after all. I felt that my stories allowed my readers to reflect on Philippine history in a way that was not preachy or boring. I felt I educated them as well as entertained them with my stories. I should mention that not all of my stories have strong historical presence, but I always do research and I always place my characters in a particular time and place. Even if not clearly apparent, I, in my imagination, I know the politics, the culture, the history, the backstory um, of, of this character's setting. When I was a beginning writer, I was conscious of who my readers would be. And this probably stemmed from the fact that I workshopped my stories before finalizing and sending them out for publication. Since I attended writing workshops at UCLA Extension's Writers Program, where I later taught for over 20 years, I wrote to be understood by my teachers and my workshop participants, and they were all generally educated, English speaking, and highly critical. I learned early on to create believable characters because discussions always revolved around character and conflict, aside from language, grammar, style, the other elements of uh, storytelling. I learned early on that I had to write stories that were authentic to my background because my teacher and my companions could spot work that was imitating Hemingway. In fact, I still feel the pain when I remember a workshop participant critique my work for having a character who could have been a New Yorker. She said, this has no redeeming value. A New Yorker could have written this. Still stings up to now, but it made me work hard to improve my craft. I learned to write in a fairly simple, straightforward way and to focus on character and his or her development rather than to be cute with the English language, to you know, use highfalutin uh, words and so on. Eventually, these things became second nature to me. And so I don't have to think a lot about tailoring the language for an age group or work hard at sound being Filipino. In fact, since I will write about non-Filipino characters sometimes, I have learned that what carries my stories are, are primarily the characters and how complex or interesting they are, and if there is credible character development in their stories. On other occasions, if I am writing a children's story or a young adult story, I am also aware of who the readers are because the subject matter and language have to be appropriate to the age group. However, having said that, I have to clarify that I do not tailor my writing to be a bestseller or to please an editor or publisher. I generally follow the lead of my characters. This is called character-driven writing versus plot-driven. It is an unwieldy and inefficient way of writing. I do not outline. I do not have a formula. I start most stories with a vague notion, a few images in my head, a scene perhaps, a character in my head whom I don't know as of yet. But, but there is enough there to intrigue and interest me. And so I will bat this around in my head, ask questions, play with it until more images, snatches of dialogue and other magical things happen. It is a slow process for me, 
But to me, it is also very exciting, especially when at last I get into writing what had been these vague, vague things in my head, and I am able to put it out in written form. No, living in California did not lead me to write more stories about Cebu than I would otherwise have written. The teachers and writers in the writing workshops I attended in the U.S. never encouraged me to write about Cebu. My good teachers, the fine ones, encouraged me to focus on character and character development. I had to learn storytelling elements, of course, such as dialogue, scene, setting, plot, and so on. But I always understood that character carried the story, at least my stories. So I think my thought process in terms of writing went like this. I would like to write good and unique stories, stories that do not mimic Western stories. There are enough Western stories after all, so why should I contribute to that body of work? In addition, I am Filipino, and so I know Filipinos more than I know stories about growing up in Kansas or some other Western place. At some point, I deliberately chose Cebu as my palette, so to speak. I was born and grew up there. I knew Cebu. I had many stories about the people and about myself in that setting. And as I mentioned, I had to change Cebu to Ubek to give me free reign in making things up. There were other things going on in my head when I was learning how to write fiction. I realized that the literature and history I was taught were Eurocentric. I recall the Philippine history book when I was in school that had a chapter or two about pre-Hispanic Philippines, and the rest of the book was about Magellan's arrival in Cebu, Legaspi's return to the Philippines, and a long string of Spanish gobernador Silios, followed by Philippine-American War, and so on. The literature I read was primarily Western as well, and so the images and knowledge in my head were not from a Filipino point of view in the beginning. I wanted to see things from a Filipino, or at least from my point of view, and by the time I started to write seriously, that was what I wanted. I wanted to see things from a Filipino point of view. I wanted to imagine in my head how Philippine history went from the eyes of the Filipinos. I questioned historical statements such as Ferdinand Magellan discovered the Philippines. Magellan did not discover the Philippines. The Philippines had been there long before he showed up. Or related to the Philippine-American War, the Filipinos were called insurgents. Well, that's a loaded word. The Filipinos were fighting for their freedom. They were nationalists, not insurgents. So I tried to reimagine how Philippine history could have been from the Filipino point of view. In particular, Cebu, where my family came from, intrigued me. I heard so many stories about these family members, and I knew all these places, Cathedral, Santo Nino, Fuentes Meni, and so on, and they were all very interesting to me. The facts I have mentioned contributed to my obsession on Ubek which is probably why my three novels and quite a number of short stories are set in Ubek, my mythical place. So going back to the question of how the California writers might have affected my writing, I have a story to tell. I know a Filipina writer who had a heck of a time writing and workshopping her writings in Manila because she knew the other workshoppers and she felt very self-conscious about her work. She was an academic, a well-respected academic, and she was afraid to produce fiction that would be harshly critiqued. She also worked hard to integrate Tagalog words into her work and would agonize over whether to use the word tinapa in her writing. I recall my response, why not just use salted fish so non-Tagalog writers, readers do not get confused. If you put tinapa in there, they're not gonna know what that means. 
In many ways, because I was in California and workshop my work here, my writings here, I had the opportunity to have fine teachers like Leonardo Bercovici, who was a famous scriptwriter and novelist. I had classmates who were noted journalists and poets and writers. The critiquing was top notch, in other words, and they just tried to pull out great characters and good stories from me, from participants. Further, since I was among workshop participants whom I didn't know, I didn't really know them outside of the classroom, I didn't feel afraid I would embarrass myself by producing a bad draft. Of course, I don't know how I would have turned out if I learned my craft in the Philippines. It is possible that I may have spent a lot of time trying to be like Hemingway, or perhaps I may have tried to stop so hard to be Filipino and agonize over whether to put Cebuano words and uh, tinapa or, and so on and so forth. Or maybe like Lina Espina Moore and other fine writers, I would have found my own writer's voice there. I don't know. But I am grateful for how things turn out for me as a writer. The whole experience of finding a literary agent who sold my first novel to Dutton Penguin was an exciting experience. It was a new experience dealing with a big New York publishing house with various departments that handled editing, cover, marketing, and so on. My editor at Dutton Penguin, Rosemary Ahern, was really good at her craft, and I learned a lot from her. Even though the novel had already been published in the Philippines, Rosemary had a really good eye um, about transitions and development. She loved my novel and she made sure it was categorized as an adult book, not young adult, which was apparently considered because my protagonist, Yvonne, is a young girl. Don Penguin used the art of Pasita Abad for the cover. Let me uh, show it to you. So this is uh, Pasita's art. Uh, in, in the um, Dutton Penguin uh, edition. And Dutton Penguin being a big house had a budget to promote the book and they sent me on a book tour and the book got ex excellent reviews from Associated Press, Los Angeles Times, Booklist, Bu Publishers Weekly and many, many other uh, reviewers and there were numerous write-ups. So yes, the release of the novel by a big publishing house was exhilarating and fun. The downside here is that big publishing houses are in the business of making money. And when a book doesn't sell as they want it to, these big houses will remainder the work. Uh, remainder means to discontinue the book. And this unfortunately happened to When the Rainbow Goddess Wept. The remaindering happened during a time when there were mergers of publishing houses in the US and in Europe, and the new owners of the publishing houses were keen on making money. That was, it was just pure business for them. So I am proud to say that when the Rainbow Goddess Wept was remaindered along with Theo Van Gogh's The Letters of Vincent Van Gogh. Vincent Van Gogh, the famous painter. So I imagine an accountant sat in front of a list of their books at Dot and Penguin, and he drew a line cutting off uh, the titles that didn't sell a lot of copies. So Theo Van Gogh's book fell to the, the wayside as did Rainbow Goddess. The upside is that not too long after Dot and Penguin discontinued the book, I got a phone call from a Stanford professor looking for 200 copies of the book for his class. And when he learned that the book was remaindered, he said, no, this cannot be. And he connected me with his editor at the University of Michigan Press, which then reprinted the novel. Let me show you how that version looks like. So this version remains in print. And as I mentioned, the book is also uh, available in the Philippines, reprinted by the University of Santo Tomas Publishing House. 
The novel has also been translated into Turkish, although this is now out of print. So I just want to add that I believe the longevity and interest in my novel, When the Rainbow Goddess Wet, also known as Song of Yvonne, is because of the World War II connection. World War II, of course, was an important historic event, and my novel tells a story of that great war in the Pacific from a young girl's point of view. My second novel, Magdalena, had its own journey. In a nutshell, this novel tells the stories of three generations of Filipino women whose lives have been affected by the Philippine-American War, World War II, and the Vietnam War. It's a slender book written in a fragmented style, a favorite among poets and academics. Let me show you a um, copy of the book. So this is, this is what Magdalena, the Philippine edition looks like. After writing my first novel, uh, When the Rainbow Goddess Wept, I decided to work on my second one. Having, having written a fairly successful first novel, I felt I knew everything there was to know about writing a novel. So I set about writing the second novel using a way of thinking I had picked up from the first. That is, I started off writing in a linear way. I had started my first novel right when World War II began, and the novel moved along sequentially until the war ended. So I started Magdalena in the 1960s in Ubeck about a young woman in a failed marriage uh, to a Filipino who has a querida. My protagonist, Magdalena, meets an American from Mactan Air Base, an American captain, and they fall in love and have a love affair that was most certainly taboo in Ubeck at the time. The querida system and extramarital relationships are not such foreign ideas in Filipino culture. I had heard of such real live stories. So one thing that happened was that even though I tried to focus on Magdalena and her story, other characters would butt in and want their stories told. There was her mother, Luisa. There was her cousin, Estrella. There was her grandmother, Juana La Guapa, and many other characters. I would try to keep from writing about them, but they would occupy my mind. And it was almost as if I could see scenes with them and there was dialogue going on. I had no choice but to write their stories. Because I realized my work was getting choppy and sprawling, I wrote connective narratives to try and string the, the scenes together. Then I realized that I was bored with my work and I'd start, and start to get sleepy when I was working. So by the time I had a book length draft, I knew it was a mess. I would rewrite again to make the work more smooth and it remained a mess. After a while, I gave up and decided to save what I could of my work. I knew some parts were, were well written because sections had already been published in journals and magazines. So I decided to lift those good parts and other good parts and work to have a short story collection instead of a novel. So I sat down, I worked chapter by chapter, basically removing the boring narratives pulling out the good parts. And after a while, I noticed that the good parts actually told a bigger story. I realized that this was the format this novel wanted to be fragmented. The parts I salvaged were from different points of view, from different time frames, from the, some from the 1960s, some from the 1940s, some from 1912. I added a genealogy chart to clarify who was who. I added epistolary letters 
from the young pregnant woman, Juana, who is ostensibly telling the story of her family to explain her situation. And there the novel was. A small press in the United States uh, published Magdalena first. The publisher, the, Su the poet, Susan Bright, loved the novel and she designed the book herself and she took great care um, you know, of this novel. Magdalena, per se, was not as popular as the first novel, When the Rainbow Goddess Wept, which was a World War II novel and which had a wider uh, audience. But this second novel received fine reviews from World Literature Today, Malleus, Philippine Graphic, and other journals. I would later discover there were academics like Luisa Igloria, Jack Wigley, and Rodora G. Magan, and others who wrote about the book. I have actually since learned to respect whatever work comes out of me. There is a part of me that feels the stories I write, especially the long ones like novels, come from a higher being. My writing process has no real system. It is unwieldy. I plan on writing something, but the work makes its turns on its own and comes out different from what I had originally envisioned. It's like magic. I have another comment. Writers generally want to be published by a big publishing house or they want their work to be a bestseller or to be commercial. But I have learned that commercial success is not necessarily connected with literary success. In fact, commercial work may not be literary at all. Think of the romances or crime mysteries we buy to read while traveling in planes, for instance. See, these books are more for entertainment than they are for, for literary uh, longevity. Because I have many things going on in my life, I am a wife, a mother, now a grandmother. I've always worked, taught, or served in writers' groups like Penn International, uh, PAWA, Philippine American Women Writers and Artists. Aside from that, I garden, I cook, I do handicrafts. As a writer, I need a structure to get serious writing done. So to get started in my third novel, the newspaper widow, I joined the NaNoWriMo. Um, this is short for National Novel Writing Month. I decided to write a draft of a murder mystery just for fun. I wanted to prove to myself I could write something different. Uh, so one November, I wrote around 1,667 words daily to get the first draft of a novel. So 1,667 words is a lot of words. You have to stop thinking and just let the words come out to meet this deadline. At the end of November, most of, I, most of what I got was drivel and re repetitive. But in the midst of all the 50,000 words were parts that sparkled. There were sections about a priest who was not such a good guy. There were scenes of a character who was a widow in Obec in 1909. There was a French woman who was her best friend. There were bits and pieces of this novel in the midst of that NaNoWriMo draft. So from this mess, I developed a hazy story, a kind of a plot line in my head about the discovery of a dead body of a priest in a creek near the San Agustin Church in Obec my mythical setting. So bit by bit, the story developed. The son of the widow Inez was picked up and accused of murdering the priest. Inez and her friend Melisande, the French seamstress, set out to solve the crime. So my original intention was to write a more commercial, more formulaic story. I thought this would be fun, you know, and easy. But writing formula must go against my grain because once again the characters came to life with their own stories and I was conf 
compelled. I was compelled to tell their stories, even as I tried to follow the mystery plotline. The protagonist, protagonist Inez, used my grand, great grandmother as my as the not model. The French Melisande was inspired by a French woman I know. I had to do research to have a good grasp of the historical period wherein this story happens, which is the American period. That time when the United States was testing the waters of being an imperial power, 1909, the Philippines at that time was in transition from the so-called Spanish times to American times. I had to understand not just the politics of the time, but also the nitty gritty of how streets, street lamps, train stations, American era buildings looked like. At the same time, I looked at the personal history of my great grandmother to help me imagine how life may have been during that time. From family oral stories, I knew my real great grandmother, Remedios Lopez Cuenco, lived in the Parian, that her husband died when she was only 39, and she took over her husband's Imprenta Rosario, even while she rented out houses that she had built so she and her children would survive. I had my grand uncle's book, Autobiograph autobiography of Archbishop Jose Maria Cuenco to guide me. So writing this book was actually fun because not only did I get the story written, but I learned a lot about what Cebu was like or could have been like during the American period. And I also developed a deeper understanding of my great grandmother. It was also satisfying to have created what the writer Brian Ascalon Rowley calls a, quote, literary mystery. So the end result of the novel is well described by the library journal in the United States. And let me, let me quote that because it describes it well. When her husband dies in 1909, Inez Maceda inherits his newspaper, which is running out of audience and funds. She soon finds that she's good at both the money, the money side and the reporting side. The paper gets a scoop about the discovery of the body of a priest who had been missing several months. But any pleasure in Inez's coup is dampened when her son Andres is imprisoned on suspicion of murdering the priest, whose past turns out to be shadier than imagined. What follows is part detective story and part historical fiction set in the Philippines seven years after the conclusion of the Philippine-American War, which ran from 1899 to 1902, that cemented U.S. occupation of the islands. The mystery elements are competently plotted and the characters appealing, and there's a charming long distance romance with a hint of another yet to come. The book's signal virtue though, is its big hearted look at Filipino culture and society in 1909. So I do really like that last sentence of that book review. The book's signal virtue, though, is its big-hearted look at Filipino culture and society in 1909. So this is an interesting question. Are you read more in the Philippines or abroad? I am not sure what the answer is to this question. My guess is that book sales may be the same in the U.S. and in the Philippines, but then book sales per se may not determine the number of readership because my work is included in anthologies and my books are in libraries, which we assume people read. I have placed online uh, my How to Write Book, Fundamentals of Creative Writing, for instance. This is on Wattpad for free. I did this during the pandemic and school when schools were locked down and this was the purpose was to help teachers. The book is still up, go to Wattpad, search for Cecilia Brainerd. So this, this particular site has several thousand hits. 
which if you really consider is not that large given the book is free. But I feel glad that teachers and students have been able to access this for free during a critical time when people were virtually imprisoned in their homes. So going back to the question, my guess is that my work is read more in the Philippines and abroad because the subject matter of my stories relates more to Filipinos. Many of my stories and essays that have been anthologized in textbooks and many um, libraries also carry my work. But then libraries in the US also carry my books, so both in the US and in the Philippines, so it's hard to gauge. My work is primarily what you call literary, and most of the books have the narrow topics of Filipino or Filipino-American. This is my subject matter. The volume of book sales, the question of audience for literary work is considerably less than the popular or commercial books. For example, a book of poetry may have a 500 uh, print run, 500 copies. And uh, those 500 copies will take years to sell out. A commercial book may have 25,000 to 50,000 to 150,000, sky's the limit, you know, depending on how, how uh, popular it is. Um, so they will have those copies. Um, so we're talking about apples and oranges here. Uh, on the one hand, you have the literary work or works of poetry or literary work, and you have the commercial, which is basically for entertainment. So this was one of the things I learned early on when I was learning the business of writing. It was, it was quite a revelation. And at some point when I was learning how to write fiction the correct way, I actually considered writing romance novels. I thought I could kick out one book a year and I would make money and be famous. So um, I looked into it and I realized most romance novels follow formula. So for instance, boy meets girl, boy is separated from girl, boy looks for girl, boy overcomes obstacles, boy finds girl, and reunited, they live happily ever after. So I thought, well, I, I can learn this and I can write uh, something like this. Well, what I discovered was that I would still have to work many hours on it. I would have to get up every day, sit in front of my typewriter. That was what we had then, a typewriter. And I would have to create and develop my story. And that, that was work. That was a lot of work. So I remembered thinking at that time that if I was going to put work into this matter of writing, I might as well write about what I want to, what I care about. At that point, I already decided I would not be writing for money or success or fame, but would do my best to create the best stories that I could. My thinking has always been geared towards aiming for the best I could create, that I never thought much about how many people would read a work, if it would make a lot of money and so on. I wanted just the best stories and then I would get them published somewhere reputable. I, I called this finding a home for my work. And once I had done that, I would move on to my next writing project because there was and is always something that needs exploring. Having said that, I have to say that I have appreciated a good, good thoughtful book reviews of my books. Good book reviews and write-ups are encouraging but on the other hand, it can inflate your head and it takes work to ground yourself again to get back to work. I find writing to be humbling work. I get into a book project not knowing exactly where it will end up. I have these scattered ideas and images and I try to make sense out of them. Sometimes, sometimes the work has to be abandoned or sometimes I have to edit the work ruthlessly. I find I have to make myself a kind of a tool for this thing in my head. I do my best and I have to get it critiqued, suffer the pain of that process, then rewrite and rewrite some more, 
then when I have made it as good as I can, I have to go through the process of finding a home for the work. And after that, I still have to do my part to let the world know about the book because a writer should should try to um, promote the book for the sake of the book or else no one will know about it. I have to say that it is gratifying to know that my novels and my other books are part of course curricula for all school levels, not just graduate schools. What this indicates to me is that someone or some persons read and carefully considered my work and they passed judgment that the books have something to say to the students and or the books allow the teachers to bring in ideas that can help educate students. I will add that I have found particular satisfaction in how my stories have been taught to the young. So short stories like Woman with Horns or Flip Gothic have been used by educators of upper elementary and high schools. The books I edited, uh, Growing Up Filipino One and uh, the two subsequent ones, uh, Growing Up Filipino Two and Growing Up Filipino Three have been used in classrooms in the United States and in the Philippines as well. The first two Growing Up Filipino books were part of National Geographic's summer reading list in 2020, which, which was very gratifying to me because the books had been in print for a while and yet National Geographic at some point got a hold of these books and past judgment that these were good books. So all of these are gratifying and I feel they validate my work and they encourage me to continue. Those vague ideas and images in my head that I have slaved over to give form um, have been judged to be relevant in terms of educating students. I am well aware that educating someone goes beyond giving them information but that education can actually change a person. I hope therefore that students can gain a sense of pride, a stronger sense of self perhaps, a deeper understanding of other people, empathy for other people. These are all good things. And if my work contributes to all that, then I am proud and happy and satisfied that all that labor and work have been worth it. There may be writers who write purely for self-expression or for clarification of their thoughts. Even though I say that a lot of my creative energy goes into giving form to vague ideas in my head, the ultimate desire is to share those ideas with others. When I wrestle with my stories to make them understandable, entertaining, informative, educational, inherent in all that is for the audience, the reader that is, will read and understand, be entertained, and be informed by my work. To me, writing is a form of communication. In other words, it's a two-way affair between the writer and the reader. From the time I read those books that my father bought for me at Alimar's, Nancy Drew, Anne of Green Gables, and so on, I believed that stories are created, published, um, and others will pick them up and read them and, and decipher them and understand them in their heads. I have also felt that my stories need to be published before I feel they have found homes. Otherwise they feel unfinished and, and I continue to tinker with them. Even the early published stories feel complete um, because they have been published. I rarely rewrite them, even though I find that there are cliches in there and I could 
now make them better. To me, they're complete. They're done. But that was the old Cecilia who wrote that, and I'm going to honor that. Um, I will copy edit those old, those early stories if they are part of uh, another anthology. It is, of course, gratifying to consider that my work is received well by readers. Um, they do not have to be a huge number of readers, but even if my work can touch a few, that is very satisfying. I realize that readers have a wide choice of reading material, and if they choose mind, mine, and find work satisfying, then that is also very satisfying and very encouraging to me. I believe that good stories, and I hope that some of mine are, can influence people's behavior or attitudes. These stories can affect values and beliefs. These are big things to actually influence people in this way. Realizing this makes me grateful to readers who welcome my ideas, who allow my ideas to change them, to make this, this uh, uh, act as catalyst to them. Um, I should add that while it makes me happy and proud that people, Cebuanos, if that is true, receive my work well, I actually try not to let this get to my head. Um, imagine if I were on stage and I get a loud ovation, I will bow and smile. But I know that after that, I will have more work to do. And that sometimes my work will not be that great. Or sometimes my work will even fail. But I, I believe that because this is the gift given to me, it is, it is a gift given. Um, then I will continue doing what I'm doing anyway in the best way that I can. Well, uh, Cecilia Munguera Brainard is an award-winning author and an editor of about 20 books. And her short stories, uh, like Flip Gothic, you know, uh, has been taken up in the undergraduate reading in literature. And of course, her novels, like uh, When the Rainbow Goddess Swept, um, is used in the graduate curriculum, even uh, the novel Magdalena. <clears throat> Her articles are also widely anthologized. Now, I mention uh, prize winning uh, because she has a lot of prize winning stories and among these prizes were the California Arts Council Fellowship in Fiction and she also had a special recognition award for her work on the Asian American youth and a Brody Arts Fund Award. And um, Cecilia also got recognized by the California State Senate and was also awarded the Outstanding Individual Award from Cebu City. So virtually she's uh, recognized by both the Filipino and the American communities that she served. And she received different travel grants also the Filipinas Magazine Award for Arts. And her books won prestigious acclaim like the Gintong Aklat Award and the Gourmand Prize. Or was it the Gourmand Award? I first met Cecilia Brainard uh, in the 1990s and uh, she came to the university and she had a talk at the AVR. That AVR is now the Butenbrook Hall and she was talking about this um, gathering of people, the powwow, and the way she spoke was so magical. The way she, you know, she handled herself was showed that she was really a storyteller because uh, her voice was well modulated and you sort of had to you know, inch your ear a little bit just to, you know, to hear more. But it was, 
really uh, loud enough that you could hear, but that draw, that kind of pull was there. Um, Helena Grice, who is a critic, reads Cecilia Manguera Brainard's novel, uh, When the Rainbow Goddess Wept. Uh, this was published in 1991, but originally this novel was titled The Song of Yvonne. And actually, I have both copies. As using the device of a talking story, where you have a woman telling a story from one generation to another. And, you know, this was how it seemed when she stood there talking. The room was so quiet and everybody was just all ears. Now, the talk story has many functions, and it's not only social, but it also offers a range of emotions and intentions. Now, um, Grice was saying that Bernard uses this method as a means of imagining both different kinds of writing and experiences that, you know, that writing communicates. So the novel, Actually, uh, the Song of Yvonne is historically set during the Japanese occupation of, uh, of the Philippines and specifically in Cebu, which she calls Ubek. Now, here there are two things going on. On the one hand, you have the horrors of the guerrilla warfare and people, you know, constantly moving around to avoid detection. And there is also the the dream world that the cook, uh, Laidan, which is uh, the character that, you know, uh, that dream world that Laidan inhabits. Now, uh, Laidan tells stories to the young child, Yvonne, so she can escape from the harsh reality of the war. And these are folk tales and epics, which are in a way narratives of resistance, of valor in the face of tremendous odds. And also, you have a blend of the mythic and magical elements. I remember when I was reading uh, the novel for the first time, I was thinking, wow, there are a lot of you know, stories, these epics, almost all the epics um, are scattered all over the, all over the, the novel. And at first I was thinking like, it should just focus on a, a certain epic or not. But uh, it was later as I ruminated, you know, when, when you read a book and when you're a scholar, you have first readings, second readings, third readings, and all of that. And that was when I, I realized that, you know, there is this, uh, a lot of stories and which the character Yvonne is supposed to be able to live by. And, uh, and it also, you know, gives a lot about, you know, what the Philippines is like, what the stories in the Philippines are like. So um, I would agree with Grice when she says that the talking story here acts as some kind of counter narrative, as is, as you know, it transects the historical narrative because on one side you have the the Japanese occupation happening, which is historical, but then you have another narrative counteracting it. The, the mythical narrative. And it also shows, you know, the strong bonding between Laidan and Yvonne, which later, this is so beautiful, you know, later Yvonne, when she comes of age, uh, she sort of passes on uh, with others in a communal experience when she continues the talk story when she continues that storytelling. So by telling the story from Yvonne's perspective, uh, Brainard actually allows a powerful comparison between, you know, the adult world uh, of war and, you know, the clashes of culture and there's politics and survival with that of, uh, you know, telling the story. So it sort of is a way to 
to deal with the horrors of of life and that is somehow very powerful because that's what we have what we have our stories to help us get through get through life get through the day get through the problems that we are encountering only in this case it's it's the it's just the novel and that's how for me you know literature functions a powerful story to take us away sweep us off our feet now <clears throat> the striking thing about Brainard's fiction is its um, engagement no? not only with ethnicity and race but its intersections with class as you know as it reimagines a more communal and collective mode of agency like you know drawing from the incredibly rich and diverse cultural traditions that thrive not only in the Philippines but also in in the United States so being a writer who straddles both America and the Philippines she uh, actually mines the diversity uh, of cultural traditions and that that coexist and it's not only in uh, when the rainbow goddess wept it's in Magdalena it's in the newspaper widow so uh, it's so rich and you know it often exists in tension with each other you know the cultural traditions and you know the tension so and this creates a hybrid conception of subjectivity and agency that is actually more communal in force and in vision by shifting it to a notion of communal agency that values daily life uh, and views the multiple practices that characterizes everyday life as you know areas where individual and communal identities are constructed and can potentially be reimagined Bernard's fiction effectively resituates and reconceives the notions of identity and agency very effectively. So the novel's position is that if agency is to be possible in a contemporary Filipino-American culture, that contains and constrains individuals community needs to be reconceived as you know flexible and in a flux as a as a function of a dialectic between the individual and the community and between the need and choice so um although the novel magdalena is also set during the war it centers on the changes that a family goes through the narratives of three generations of women uh, in you know the characters of the grandmother juana la guapa the mother luisa and the daughter magdalena uh, from whom the novel is titled but you know there is also a a Magdalena who is ah uh, no it's Juana okay anyway most of the people in this novel are privileged with class and dictating their choices or that happens to them so there are many stories woven in the novel that are told through letters and um, journal entries that open up windows to the world of Cebu well as in this case again it's Ubek. Um, Brainard calls her place Ubek. And I actually love the women characters in Magdalena. You know, both Luisa and Magdalena, but I guess Luisa more since she is strong and fierce and um, I admire the honest portrayal of her character. Uh, this is what I like about Brainard's writing. It's so honest you can 
you know, you find people like that. And we know she does not come from a rich family, this uh, Louisa here, and becomes married to Fermin, who is landed. Now that she is his wife, she is described uh, in the chapter. Well, let me find it. I think it's going to uh, going to the Manila Hotel as being busy shedding her uh, provincial ways. All right. So this is very interesting. I would like to read this part. She fired her dressmaker and acquired a couturier. But even the most expensive couturier of Aubec could not eradicate Louise's love for flounces and brilliant colors. Two more things that made Isabel smirk. No matter, Louisa went ahead and spent Fermin's money to make herself look rich. She realized she could never look old rich, but rich was rich. Louisa also liked to hobnob with the wealthy, which Isabel called social climbing. But here again, Louisa didn't give a centavo. She had her diamonds, her designer clothes, and she wanted to show them off to the very people who could tell the difference between the fake diamonds on her wedding tiara and the real ones. But, you know, I also enjoyed Fermin, who was clearly a nature lover and created a vacation house on their Mactan property by you know by the beach and you have glass windows and glass doors that ensured a magnificent view of the sand and the sea from every room can you imagine that i could just you know imagine what what beautiful house it was well you even had a, a bathroom with a sunken bathtub while Bernard's work values the elements of diverse ethnic traditions and borrows from these cultural traditions, there seems to be a refusal to be static, but rather, you know, highlight their fluidity by engaging in a creative bricolage to create, you know, a hybrid in the sense of a new, stronger, healthier, more utopian version of concepts addressed differently in the various already hybrid cultural traditions that make up the Philippines and even, you know, American culture. For Brainard, identity can be viewed as a, as a, what you call an ensemble of subject positions that can never be totally fixed in a closed um, system. And it's always contingent and precarious. It's temporarily fixed at the intersection of um, subject positions. So you can see this clearly in, in Magdalena, you know, these points at which the subject positions meet and intersect functions as nodal points, uh, you know, what you call partial fixations as um, precarious forms of identification and um, these have the potential to actually construct forms of um, unity and common action that do not depend on centered subjects or on pre-existing identities or unities. As uh, subsequent close readings will demonstrate, the novels explore how the intersections between the subject positions of the characters you know, they function as historically and culturally specific you know, temporary grounds from which they can act by constructing and sustaining communities from which to organize you know, collective political action. Going back to the notion of community, while, you know, uh, the contemporary yearning and nostalgia for community um, clearly indicates, you know, the need for belonging, you know, a longing for what uh, Maurice Blanchot calls uh, a being together. You know, communities historically have all too often 
tended to participate in exclusionary practices. For instance, if we talk about you know the the Greek polis, then uh, it continued to serve as an ideal community of a in which you know politics was not confined to the state, but in was was conducted in everyday life in self government by citizens, but 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 it functioned via a high degree of exclusion. Uh, you know there were people excluded like women and slaves. Now in contrast, the contemporary American fiction, or you know, Filipino American fiction by Brainard that. I read explores possibilities for community that focus on um, on the other. It focus it gives a focus on uh, the other with a capital O as fully human and that it's more inclusive and indeed it embraces diversity. So you know it promotes individuality but not individualism so there's a difference there and instead of erasing it as in the case of what we will say exclusivist communities it you know it, it embraces instead and um, I would also say that this text will share what Zygmunt Bauman uh, you know he had this vision that the only hope for the community at the turn of the 21st century is in a community woven together from sharing and mutual care. So it's a community of concern and responsibility for the equal right to be human and the e equal ability to act on that, on that right. And that you can find so much in, in Baynard even the, in the newspaper widow. So the models of community that this text of hers, that these novels offer, envision the individual as necessarily engaged in a relationship of interdependence with community through a process of care and responsibility and um, an acceptance of others in all their diversity. So I recall very much here the spirit of uh, the philosopher Emmanuel Levinas, whose philosophical ideas, you know, talked about the other with a capital O, you know. Um, in this text, literary text of Bernard, uh, they reject the opposition between the self and the other that has dominated, um, you know, Western thought and instead presented the self as being fully human only in his or her acceptance of a responsibility for and a welcoming of, of the other. Because you also have here uh, characters from, you know, different countries, um, Americans like, you know, Nathan, Nathan in in Magdalena and um, so although Levinas does not uh, posit the other in terms of ethnicity he does not do that or race per se his emphasis on the mutually beneficial process of recognizing you know the common humanity of the self and the other and moving beyond egoism and imperialism makes his theoretical model useful to a discussion of the ways of creating you know positive uh, forms of community that you find in this in in the novels of of Brainard uh, within an ethnically and racially diverse nation like uh, the United States so you know um, Every year, uh, Cecilia comes to the Philippines, except during the pandemic, because of course uh, travel was was prohibited. And I've always looked forward to her trip every year, uh, because although she lives in California, she travels 
back to the Philippines and she has lectured and performed in many literary events not only in the Philippines but uh, worldwide uh, she teaches creative writing at uh, a writer's program at the UCLA extension it's the University of California in Los Angeles extension and each time she comes there is always a wonderful activity to look forward to so well hopefully uh, she will come soon and we will have a, a great event I met Cecilia Brainard uh, in the public library. When I was in college, I used to volunteer in the public library. And I guess one of the, the bright spots about that was getting to meet um, the writers who would uh, visit the public library. And I met Cecilia Brainard uh, because she had a, a book reading, if I, I can't really recall, but um, she had an activity in the public library. So I had the opportunity to talk to her. Um, I was wondering what her works were because I was not really familiar with our local writers at that time. And uh, the short story that I was able to access and read was talking about her memories in St. Teresa's College, which to me was a, a little bit new because um, growing up in Cebu and being my age at that time, where uh, when I think of stories, they're always about um, like grand adventures. I, I found it a little strange that she was writing about something so familiar uh, STC, my mom went there, my cousin went there, um, my sister had piano lessons across STC. So I found it a bit of an unusual uh, like, uh, focus for a story. Of course, in my, at my age now, um, I relish stories like that. So I, I, I was um, surprised and, and because it felt like I was reading something just so familiar. And so that, I think, is where... Um, where like the great importance of uh, the great value, the value of her stories lie. Um, when she's writing actually about something familiar, she's writing about Cebu, uh, she's um, accessing parts of our memory that maybe when you're young, you don't see the value of, but when you're older, you will really cherish. And because she's, uh, she's in the US, I think um, her nostalgia for these things are even um, more, uh, it's even um, like, uh, made clearer uh, or yeah it's made clearer in her stories so um, I really liked her idea the concept of Ubek because um, for a long time Cecilia said that she was not able to she couldn't really find stories to write uh, she was maybe able to write something good once uh, for a novel and the next time around she didn't she found that she didn't really have anything to write uh, they were like variations of the same of her first story or her first novel uh, and then that was when she came to realize that she could write about Cebu and um, that when she actually writes about something familiar she's able to tell so many stories about it and so she wrote about Ubek which is Cebu uh, a reimagined Cebu she writes about the characters the people here the places here and um, when, when I read it, or when I see some of these stories, they're also very familiar to me, but they're kind of sometimes an upside down Cebu. So that also makes it a fun uh, story to read. And her stories are very um, character driven, plot driven. So um, she has a lot of, um, I enjoy seeing how she works through this in her stories.